from the Figure Four Online Studios in beautiful Bothell, Washington, exclusively at WrestlingObserver.com. You're listening to The Brian and Vinny Show with your hosts, Brian Alvarez and Big Vinny V. All right, everybody, it's Brian and Vinny, and yes, Craig Show here on uh, Sunday, uh, November 29, 2020, figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. What a show we got for you today. Believe it or not, everybody, it's yet another free Brian and Vinny show. We literally just did one. Hmm. The last one, probably for a year, because in fact, today is Cyber Monday. I see. And the sale is back on. Understood. So we're giving you a free show here today. Hmm. They're going to get their money's worth. Believe it or not, you're listening to this, and we think you're going to want to sign up afterwards. I was going to say, I don't know was, why. This puts pressure on us to actually deliver a good show. No, our, don't do that. Just do your normal show. It's not our norm. I'm already listen, out of my everybody, comfort zone. Listen, all of you listening to this for free that are not subscribers, Vinny and I, Craig, we do shows all throughout the week. This is not a place where you get one show a week when you subscribe. I do two shows a day, sometimes three. Tomorrow, for example, I have three shows. Observer Live, Filthy Four Daily with former UFC superstar Tom Lawler, current wrestling superstar, and Wrestling Observer Radio with Dave Meltzer. Three in one day. Multiply that by seven days. Multiply that by 52 weeks. And then multiply that by 15 years. You know what you come up with? 1,200... 246 shows in the archives right now. Hmm. Wow. So if you sign up right now after listening to this show, you can go back and listen to every Brian and Vinny show dating back to 2005. That's a lot of shows. That is a lot of shows. Every Observer Radio dating back to when we first began in 2008. Figure Four Dailies. Lance. Lance Storm. Every Friday does a Figure Four Daily. Filthy Tom. There's a million other shows as well. 12,000. 246, I think, is the number right now. Mm-hmm. Well over 12,000. So what we're going to do today is we are going to review this Saturday night's main event from 1989. If you listen to it, you go, man, awesome. I wish I would have heard the early ones. Don't worry about it. When you <laughs> sign up for your 399, you go to the archives and you listen to them because we reviewed every one since day one up through the one we're doing today. And we're going to continue until we reviewed all of the Saturday night's main events. Vinny and I reviewed virtually every TNA pay-per-view before they fell off the real cliff. Before they got bought and whatever is going on right now. It's much better now. But unfortunately, say. there's like so much stuff that it's off the radar. But like at its worst, we reviewed it all the time. If you heard any of this stuff on YouTube, go back and listen to the entire shows. Every WWE pay-per-view, every AEW pay-per-view... Vinny and I, every AEW and NXT show they've ever done, we've reviewed head to head. Yes, we did true. the entire Monday Night Wars. Yes, starting yeah, in '95, the three of us, Raw and Nitro, on the same night, we've reviewed every single one of them through to the bitter end, and now we're doing the invasion. So basically, mm-hmm. it's three dollars and ninety nine cents. I don't want to hear any excuses. That's so cheap. Three ninety nine, everything, all the shows, all the archives. Observer newsletters. There's thousands of observers, thousands of figure fours. So just, it's your last chance this year. If you missed out on Friday, it's your last opportunity. So I'm telling you, now and midnight Eastern Monday night after Raw ends, it's over. So don't miss it. Now, with Don that West, said, with Don that West said, would Craig, be so proud. you know what else this show is besides reviewing wrestling? It's a cooking show. You know what I cook tonight? Tell me. I made keto chicken fettuccine Alfredo. Wow. Now, I will say, I will say, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd give it a 5, okay? Mm. Because I made a mistake. And that was... Hold on, what? I screwed up the sauce. Why are we talking about it, Okay. Then? Well, there's a point to this, okay? <laughs> I, okay. I was trying to make the Alfredo sauce... And I didn't let it simmer long enough. And so it was very watery. 
Mm. It didn't thicken properly. Okay. That's an issue. That's an issue. But, I mean, as far as, like, the taste of it, I mean, the taste was, like, a 9 out of 10. It tasted fucking amazing. It was just watery. And so now I know what I did wrong. And so next time, I think I can confidently make 9 out of 10. Mm. So please do not email me asking me for the recipe. It's very easy. You just Google it. You Google keto chicken fettuccine Alfredo. They all come up. The one that has the most five-star reviews, that's the one I used. Mm. And I went to the store, and I got these Impossible Noodles. Mm, okay. It's like, you ever heard of those? It's some yeah. Japanese plant like or something. Is it like Bana or something it's like that? It's something. Or? But yeah. you can actually buy them yeah. made into fettuccine noodles. I see. I see. Yeah. And they're a little so, no. more gelatinous. Like, if you really want the consistency of a real noodle, you ain't going to get it. Mm. But, like, as far as taste and... You know, if you make the sauce right, which I presume I'll do next time, I mean, it was awesome. It was so good. So that's everyone's recommendation for today. And if you're a new subscriber, you've missed our previous recommendations, which included cauliflower chicken fried rice, which was a big hit by everybody that tried it. So with that said. Is that I'm, impossible noodles? Impossible noodles, yes. You're sure it's impossible? I don't think it might not be impossible. I'll, I'll go find the package afterwards, but... It's an enormous. It was at Safeway. They're not that hard to find. Right. Fair enough. So probably not impossible. Improbable. Right. I don't know. You'll <laughs> Un- find them. Unlikely noodles. Yeah, there's some. There's some sort of plant, <laughs> of some sort that they make into a noodle. Uh huh. It's like the whole the whole package of noodles is five grams of carbs or something ridiculous. That's very few. Hmm. Very few. Oh, it's crazy. What a life we live in. I'll tell you. It is a well. It's not a golden age. It's a shitty age but it's a very shitty age but in terms of like the stuff that you can get at the grocery store yeah sure now that toilet paper's back it's golden yeah. age <laughs> yes right. it's back yeah. that's all you need fake noodles and toilet paper i mean ready for your party they really go hand in hand well yes you all have the one all right what are we doing here saturday night's main event i hope so well, i sure yeah. hope so because that's all i watch tonight Right. wwf saturday night's main event may 27th 1989 a very famous episode so usually these shows start, and there's like a half dozen promos. Each guy is on the screen for 20 to 30 seconds, screaming and ranting about whoever his opponent is that night. We only got one this time. It was the Hulkster screaming and ranting for like a minute about the big boss man. Tonight he is going to be the judge, the jury, the executioner. He is the new WWF champion. The largest arms in the world are going to push boss man's fat head through that cage. Okay, now I don't know for sure that this is what happened. But this is my conclusion from watching this promo. So they have the big blue cage, the old school big blue cage. Sure. And Hogan is standing behind it, and he's got to hype up this cage match with the big boss man. So what I conclude, based on what I watched, what I conclude happened was they said, Hulk, Terry, as you're doing this promo, shake these metal bars so people can hear the clanging of the cage. Sure. So he starts cutting his promo, and he's clanging the bars, and someone goes, cut! I can't hear Hulk! So probably done, said, all right, Hogan, cut your promo, don't clang the bars, and then we'll edit in clanging. Because if you watch it, he's just standing there doing a promo, Mm -hmm. and there's random clanging that gets edited into the background. I was like, this clanging was that fucking important. Like, we wouldn't know that this was a steel cage match if we don't hear the sound of steel clanging. But apparently it was, so that's what they did. It was very wacky. Hmm. I cannot think of a more appropriate description for these show opening promos than a bunch of random clanging happened. It was a bunch of random clanging. And then Jesse and Vince clanged on about what was on the show tonight. They did. I, they were, I believe, in Iowa, somewhere in the Midwest, and there, Jesse says something about corn country and soybean products. Maybe he had impossible noodles. So, Jesse thinks Hogan will lose tonight to the big boss man because he's thinking about Jesse's town, Hollywood, and his big movie premiere. Also tonight, two more title matches. Demolition, defending the tag team titles against the Brain Busters. And the new Intercontinental Champion, Ravishing Rick Rude, defends against King Hacksaw Jim Duggan. God, I was watching the lineup for this show. And I was like, (laughs) you fuckers are determined to have the fucking worst Saturday Night's Main Event of all time. Yes. And astoundingly, it was like a challenge. 
We're going to book an awful show, and you guys better go out and deliver. And everyone did. It was a good show. It was like a miracle. So you see footage from Mania of Bobby Heenan and Rick Rude screwing the Ultimate Warrior to win the Intercontinental title. Uh, Gene, or excuse me, Heenan tripped Warrior on a suplex and then held his foot down so Rude could get the pin. Jeans watches this footage and then he accuses Heenan of breaking every rule in the book. And Bobby says, Bobby says, I did not break rule number one, which is just win, baby. And they point out, and this is amazing when you think about it, and it's a sign of just how radically pro wrestling has changed in the ensuing 30 years. This was the first champion Bobby Heenan ever managed. Wow. Rick huh. Rude in 89. Wow. <laughs> That's stunning. Tonight, if Hacksaw thinks he's going to win, that makes him a... He's just dreaming, and dreamers always get a rude awakening. I would never accuse anybody of being herbally enhanced, but one of these two was herbally enhanced. Mm -hmm. I suspect there was a lot of enhancement of all sorts of kinds going on in these late 80s, early 90s shows. Well, we are now at the point in my wrestling fandom where I did not watch this Saturday night's main event live, Mm -hmm. but I've seen so much stuff that was on this Saturday night's main event. So I'm sure that clips were airing on primetime wrestling. I feel like we reviewed the Boss Man match sometime in the last 15 years. I bet we did. I mean, uh, that one I remember vividly, but yeah, here's Ravishing Rick Rude, who is a great fucking talker, and they don't yeah. let him say a damn thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. He has one. He has just a bunch of random one-liners, and Bobby does all the talking. Well, maybe smirk, he could. Smirk, swivel your hips, make kissy faces, get your one-liner in and go home. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Then Gene interviews King Duggan. Hideous. <laughs> Where Absolutely to hideous. Just a living cartoon character. Yes, yeah. that's exactly what he wrote. So I believe it's Memorial Day. He dedicates this match. This match here against Rick Rude to all the great Americans who gave their lives to keep the flag flying. Seriously, this match is what he dedicated to them. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, what's he going to dedicate? That's a match happening today. Anyone! I, I suppose that's true. That great belt, he says, in reference to the Intercontinental title. It was a great that, belt. That belt should not be worn over fancy pants like Rick Rude wears. <laughs> Then Hacksaw says he's all about the red, white, and blue, but this Rick Rude fella, he seems a little pink to me. Mm. Wow. Terrible thing to say. So, Although Rude Brian, has worn pink track tights before. Of course he has. And boots in this match in general. Yeah. But uh, Brian called him a cartoon character. This guy, completely cross-eyed, on purpose, doing it for the camera. He's got his tongue sticking out, and his crown keeps slumping down over his eyes, and he has to continually push it back up. He's a, a cartoon character is, is the perfect description. It's like a gimmick. It's like, we got to make some guy the king. Let's find a guy who can portray a homeless person. <laughs> sure. And we'll throw the crown on him for comedy. That's yeah. what we got here. Pretty much. And yes, he made fun of his own cross eye. Yes. Which, like, in later years, like... The heels try to make fun of him by talking about his cross eye. Sure. But he's actually the guy that started it. Yes. So the first half of this match was nothing much. Right. It's Hacksaw going, ho, oh, and Rick Rude swiveling his hips over and over and over again. Duggan hits a pile driver. Rick Rude gets a foot on the ropes. Haku, the former king, comes out to distract Hacksaw. And as he has sent it back, we go to break. Good news is it was much better after the break. Dude, I thought before the break it was good. Because it's mostly just Hacksaw bumping this guy all over the place. And Rick Rude bumped like a crazy man. And he's flying and falling down. And Duggan gives him like this this big knee. Drops his knee on the guy. He sells it like it was uh, like Hogan's leg drop. I thought it was good. And the pile driver was great. Mm-hmm. So Hacksaw makes this comeback. And as he is running wild, he goes for his three-point stance. The uh, clothesline out of the three-point stance. But he does not do out of the corner. He does it perpendicular to the ropes. And so Rude is knocked out of the ring. He pounced him. Yeah. Sort of, actually, yeah. And Hacksaw wins by count out. And he's very happy about it. Mm -hmm. Because the gimmick is, he's dumb. Dude, (laughs) I expected this match to be an atrocity. Yes. And Hacksaw, like, I can't say that he was, like, great. No. But I also can't say that the match was good only because of Rick Rude. 
Hacksaw's hair is drenched in sweat. This guy was working his ass off. I mean, he did the best he could. Fair. And Rick Rude doing half as well as he can do is, could, is yes. awesome. So, I mean, you put them together working like that, and it was so much. Like, I expected a half a star maybe. Mm-hmm. And that was like a solid two and a half. So that's fair. Two and three quarters. This is a, this is a two Who and a half star match. Who the fuck would ever expected that? Not me. Yeah. yeah, I was fixing to hate this, and then I didn't because it was fun. And I like fun. Who doesn't like fun? I, I love fun. Fun is awesome. I actually yeah. expected you to save any that you didn't. No, I just have a different idea of what's fun than you do. I see. Well, there's that. Yeah. Speaking of a different idea of fun. So here's a match that was not introduced to open the show. Randy Savage, fresh off his world championship loss to the Hulkster WrestleMania, is on the comeback trail. Who is he starting out against? In singles action, it's Jim the Anvil Lightheart. Where was Brett? I was asking the same question. <laughs> Not on the I mean, show. Well, I got to have Randy have a match on this Saturday night's main event. Sure. The, how about Brett? Oh, no, no, no. no. I'm determined <laughs> to have a bad show. <laughs> sure. No, you can't. It's going to be had, Lightheart. We did Savage and Brett on the main event. It was awesome. So therefore, we can't do it again. But you know what? It was not awful. It, it was, was okay. Awful. No, it this was, a- was another really... Now, before we get to the match... Yeah, you're, you're skipping way ahead. Jim Neidhart here. They're asking him about Sherry. Because mm-hmm. Sherry Martell, sensational Sherry, has debuted. And Anvil's just, like, randomly laughing... <laughs> Which, like, he always did in matches, you know what I'm saying? Sure. Or Brett would do all the talking, and then Anvil would say something and laugh. He did a lot of cackling, yes. You don't hear a lot of Jim the Anvil Nightheart singles promos. No. So, he's making fun of her for being scary, and then he laughs. And then, he starts laughing again, and he laughs his way off screen. I sat there and I thought, I've been watching this guy on and off for 30 years. And I have no idea what his gimmick is. What's he's, his gimmick? He's the he's anvil. The he's anvil. Crazy? Sure. Yes. Dude, look at this guy. Well, I mean, he is, but. <laughs> he went on a flat top and a. Why is he six laughing all the time? for 30 years. Because he's the anvil. I thought his gimmick does. was he threw heavy anvils. No. He was a well, shot put guy. Took out his name from yeah. the anvil well, what's, toss. What's the laughing? If he, was, if he was not the anvil, if he was just Jim Neidhart, this is how he would actually behave. It's probably very confusing for his children when he's trying to ground them or something, and then he cackles as he walks away. Stan, I'm, sure I'm not sure. That's on the list of things that would be difficult with having Jim Neidhart as a, fi- as a father. I just like that Gene's I don't first- picture Natty being grounded all that much. I could be wrong. She's like a very well-behaved young lady. Gene's first question, and I'm thinking to myself... What the hell is this match happening? Gene asks Anvil. <laughs> why is this interview happening? Why this match at this point in your career? I thought, that is a goddamn good question. That's great question. Why is this match happening? Dude, Anvil- because he wants to beat the former champion and maybe and he'll move up the ranks. He explains why, because I hate him. He, <laughs> good he answer. Be, yeah, well, that's also a very good answer. He may be able to push women around. He won't push the Anvil, baby. Without Elizabeth by your side, you ain't much of a man. Now, he also says that if Savage wants Hulk's belt, he's going to have to go through the anvil. Yes. I'm like, I never knew they were such good friends. I guess they share the same locker room. I suppose. They're Nightheart. both baby faces. Sure. Night, Nightheart's the gatekeeper. Both a little nutty. Well, that that's fair. <laughs> that's fair. So then Jesse interviews Macho Man and Sherry, and Randy Savage says, with a straight face, or whatever kind of face Randy Savage makes, after I get past... Jim Neidhart, I'm going after you, Hulk Hogan. What a strange... There's like an entire roster of baby faces just skipping in the middle here. I want to see the rankings. This doesn't make sense. Yes. Is there a top 50 in Neidhart's in the low 40s? So Savage warns Jesse not to mention Elizabeth's name. He just wants to talk about sensational Sherry, a woman who knows her place. And Sherry says that chicken-legged, bony excuse for woman is no wrestler and no lady and she's history chicken legged bony excuse for a woman Mm -hmm. that's what she called her fighting words that sure is so the match begins and despite my confusion at randy savage wrestling jim neidhart 
It's a perfectly acceptable wrestling match. Well, I mean, let's think about this. What is Randy Savage, besides everything, what does he do well? Pumps. Sells. Sells. What does Jim Neidhart do well? He runs dudes over. Doesn't sell. Perfect match. (laughs) That's fair. I will say, I couldn't even believe my eyes. So Sherry is at ringside, and on multiple occasions, Uh she attempts to interfere on behalf of her man. Right. Now, I didn't count, but it was less than nine. Okay? Fans are booing like crazy. She's obviously a heel. Randy Savage is obviously a heel. I just fucking saw this on Friday. And playing the role of Sherry Martell was the entire fucking Mysterio family all interfering and trying to screw Baron Corbin. And I'm <laughs> supposed to cheer for them. Things changed, Brian. Huh. Yeah. Back not then it was better. hot. Now it's not so hot. That's what's changed. Because no one knows what the fuck's going on and why the Mysterio family are heels all of a sudden. <laughs> So I've had some fun tonight at Jim Neidhart's expense, but once the bell rang here, this is like the best version of Jim Neidhart. He's doing these giant slingshot shoulder blocks into the ring. He's doing standing drop kicks that look great. On the floor! The, on mm-hmm. the floor. So Sherry interferes a lot, and finally, Savage is tied up in the ropes. Anvil charges. Sherry helps Savage escape. Anvil spills out to the floor. And the finish is, Savage follows him to the floor, beats him up a little, throws him inside, hits an elbow, and wins. Actually, yeah. what he did Great. is when Anvil ended up outside, Savage did the double sledge from the yes. post yes. to the floor. Mm-hmm. That's true, yes. Which, like, as a former wrestler, it's like, this fucking big heavy guy did this, like, in every match. Yeah. That's brutality on your knees. Throws the guy in, hits a flying elbow, wins. Billion times better than I expected. Yes. Like, the match was all about... And actually, what the match really was about was how many times they could get an upskirt shot of Sherry Martell. Because <laughs> it was like 55 of them in one match. I mean, that's... The cameraman, they probably hired, like, a four-year-old child. They're so short that they could only pan up. That's all they took shots of in this match. Hmm. Disgusted. I, I can tell. Have yes, some, I am. Have some respect <laughs> for Sherry Martell. Anvil looked good. Um, look just a piece of meat. Excellent manager. Excellent Anvil wrestler. Was, Anvil was Excellent like... Excellent wrestler. At points in his life, his gut was fairly large, as large as his shoulders. But he looked good here. He looked uh, in shape and stout, I guess you would say. He was definitely stout. I mean... I would never say his gut was small. Right. It, it grew and shrunk, but uh, yes, he, he was a stout man, no doubt about that. Right. Jesse interviews the big boss man and slick... I also don't want to accuse anybody of anything, but right. the big boss man was fucking sweating profusely. <laughs> and <laughs> all he here. was doing was standing there. Right. Standing He's got sweaty grimacing. armpits. He's got sweat <laughs> dripping down his face. He's standing there. Uh-huh. Well, coffee, you know, couldn't do that to a guy. So Jesse asks Slick, how did you get this match against Hulk Hogan? And Slick replies... Slickly. <laughs> Made me laugh. I'm writing that down. He claims Hogan has something to prove. He is running scared. He has lost his cool. Boss man, you've gotten Hulk Hogan behind bars. And boss man says, I, boss man vows to rehabilitate Hogan repeatedly. And then boss man says to Hulk Hogan, you're about to serve hard time with a hard man. Right. And as if that's not enough, Slick promises a big surprise. Oh, God, when he said that, I thought, no. I had no idea what it was. Well. <laughs> it sounds like they're running a train. That's I'd heard like. a rumor. God. And in fact, no, Craig, you, that's not what it was. Did you ask for forgiveness in church today, Craig? <laughs> yeah, that's if why not, I want to do next Sunday week. show. I can't remember. Anyway, go ahead. Well, everyone, the surprise is not a train. No. It's Zeus. Mm-hmm. He says Zeus is 6'11", 340 pounds. Both lies. <laughs> Zeus comes down to the ring. I should note, by the way, that no holds barred 
was the movie that Hogan was filming when he disappeared for a while. He's come back. He has won the title. Zeus has now debuted. The fucking movie isn't even out yet. No. So it's not like the movie was out, and then they decided to bring in Zeus. Like, this is... We have no idea who this fucking guy is. And then, of course, later they alert us that he's in the movie with the Hulkster, which we'll get to. (laughs) So this big fucking dude comes out, and he gives Hogan a boot (laughs) and, I believe, two Mongolian chops. Yes. The most atrocious offense you've ever seen. (laughs) Yes. Hogan goes flying. He sells it like he's dying. And Vince is in the back thinking, here's my SummerSlam main event. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Dude, it's not like, so SummerSlam. This is all summer. Fuck. <laughs> Jesus. Horrible. Yes. Yes. Zeus comes out. He comes out before Hogan does. And he stands on the steps. And maybe that's why Slick said he was six foot 11. Maybe he's counting the stairs. <laughs> maybe. Too. And Hogan comes out of surprise to see Zeus, and they have a stare down. Now, I, I actually do remember this, which is embarrassing, but I do. First of all, in their defense, I believe as recent or as uh, as soon as WrestleMania, they had been airing commercials and trailers for No Holds Barred on TV. Well, so if sure, you're watching, I'm sure there were trailers. So if you're watching all WWF programming, I'm sure you've seen Zeus a ton by this point. Uh, but then Hogan, and I remember Hogan, he, he was on like Regis or something after this. Somewhere plugging SummerSlam, they recapped everything. And he, because I remember him in a very low-key Hulk Hogan voice, talking about how he thought it was part of the show, and Zeus was there to promote the movie, and so he participated and gave him the big spaghetti lip stare down back until, much to his surprise, Zeus kicked him in the chops, and that caught him totally off guard. And that's why Zeus was able to lay him out. Hmm. So... They go to commercial with Hulk down, Hulk down on the floor. They come back. He's still down. Boss Man leaves the cage, throws him in. The match begins. So this match is famous, and I think I have actually referred to it as one of Hogan's best title defenses. And having gone back and watched it, it is a good TV main event, but mm-hmm. it's really famous for one giant spot. Yep. Which is Boss Man's running wild. It's actually the first thing Hogan, his actual first real offense Boss man's running wild. He goes to climb over the cage to escape. He makes it actually all the way over the cage and like halfway down before Hogan comes over to reach through the cage to block him. And then Hogan sort of pulls him back up to the top of the cage. And Hogan does what is really a top rope superplex. And they keep screaming it's from the top of the cage. And boss man was on top of the cage. And he's a 350 pound man. That's a giant bump for a guy this size. And Hogan's a 300-pound man, so falling off the top rope is a huge bump for him, too. And they do this massive move. No one's ever seen anything like it. In later years, they would have given it the ring to break or something. But uh, it's it's colossal. It's an amazing sight. And both guys are down forever. The ref, and this is one of those escape the cage matches, escape the cage rules matches. So the referee is just on the floor the whole time. But they're down for so long, he actually has to go in to make sure they are alive and can continue. And he begins to count them both out until they rise up and begin to fight more. Actually, what he does is they're both down. And so first, he raises the arm once, and the arm drops. He raises the arm twice, and the arm drops. And I'm waiting for the third one, but instead he goes, one! Like, that was weird. And he counts to eight or whatever, and they get up. So they got up, and uh, Slick tosses a chain in. That gets used. Guys start running each other running each other into the cage. Hulk makes this big comeback, and he's ramming Boss Man's head into the turnbuckle. I'll say one thing for this big Boss Man. He could take a head into the turnbuckle. He's seeing from way back here to way down here really, really fast, over and over again. And Hogan gets the chain that was used on him. He uses that, and Boss Man gigs, goes into the cage, and gets leg dropped. So he's about done. Slick runs into the cage to try to help this man. Somewhere in here, the big boss man is crushed on the top rope, which he sells, as I recall, by sticking both arms straight up into the air. Yes. As if to say, oh, no, my balls. <laughs> so this leaves Hogan alone with Slick. Uh, uh, before, uh, before that, Hogan gets a hold of the handcuffs they were going to use on him, have used on him in the past. He handcuffs boss man to the top rope, works Slick over a little bit. 
and then goes to climb over, realizes as he's halfway through climbing over, Slick has the key to the handcuffs, and it is actually a race now. But he wins, he's able to descend to the side of the cage before Slick can free the big boss man. Hulk Hogan wins, still your champion, and this feud is done. You know, there's so much that I could say about this match. So, they feuded for six months, I think. Uh, at least, yes. Yeah, and most of it was like dark matches and et cetera, et cetera. They did four cage matches that I could find near the end of the feud. And there's this one. There's another one in Madison Square Garden where Boss Man also takes the superplex off the cage. And if you watch this match, Boss Man's on the cage. Hogan gets to the top rope. Hogan goes to hook him. And it takes a while for Boss Man to get in position. And then they hit the big move. If you watch the footage of the one they did in Madison Square Garden, I mean... It's like an hour for Boss Man to get in position and take that bump. So I presume that's the first time they did the bump. And then when it was over and they realized nobody died, they, they used it here <laughs> in this big televised grand finale. Believe it or not, after doing this match, which was a very high-impact match, they actually had another cage match the next fucking day. Wow. 24 hours later, the dark match of a Superstars taping, they did a cage match again. I don't know if he came off the top of the cage in that one. But for whatever reason, I remember this from when I was a kid, okay? Mm -hmm. But the weirdest thing about it is the one here, when you're watching the television, they come off the left side, far side of the cage. Yes. When you watch the MSG one, they come off the left side, far side of the cage. Okay. Okay. The fucking one I've remembered for like 30 years, they come off the left near side. I can like vividly remember this in my head. So either I'm completely out of my fucking mind, mm -hmm. or maybe there was like a Coliseum home video and they had a different angle, or it was a different match and there was a footage of it or something. I don't even know, but that's what I remember. I also remember, which is incorrect, it seemed like they did a suplex from miles up in the air. Yes. And really, as you noted, Hogan is just standing on the top rope, and Boss Man is like as low as he can get on top of the cage, and Hogan tosses the guy off. So, I mean, it was a big bump for the Boss Man, and it was a big bump for Hogan, too, but it's so much lower than I remember. And part yeah. of it is because in the subsequent years, when they started building the metal, and then they started doing Hell in a Cell... And then they started having these legitimate gigantic cages that people did stuff off of. I mean, people did come off some high fucking cages. Yeah. In WWE and in Impact. Yes. And so yeah. you look back at this quaint blue cage, and it's like, it's barely taller than the top rope. Mm -hmm. And, you know, people remember the snooker dive, the famous snooker dive off the top of the cage. And when you actually look back at it, he's barely higher than the top rope. Doing the same big splash that he did every time. But they worked their asses off. I yes. thought the match was really good. Boss Man's bleeding. He, bleed in the, he bled in the MSG match as well. And it was a great grand finale. And you can always tell watching super, uh, these, these Saturday Night's main events, which matches are the grand finale. Yeah. And which matches are leading to matches on the road. So they did this match. They did the one more match the next night. They may have done one more non-cage dark match, but this feud's over. Mm. And this was the big blow-off right here. This is one of those matches when I was a kid that everybody talked about. Did you see Hogan and Bossman in the cage? And and uh, watching them come off the top rope and watching the fans jump out of their seats, getting a real reaction. Um, it's as Going back and watching it today, it was like, this is okay, but... Then, when I watched it on Saturday Night's Main Event, it was like the greatest match that I'd seen in a long time. Because it's, it's, it's one of those okay. matches. It's like it's like watching... Actually, the TLC matches are a little different because the, the TLC matches true. in 2001, it's like they were setting a standard that would be even higher today, except guys ended up having brain damage and killing their sure. families and all of these terrible things, and so they were required to dial it down. 
But if you compare stunt matches from 25 years ago to stunt matches today, mm-hmm. I mean, in most places around the world, the stunt matches today are way crazier. But sure. if you look at just an actual professional wrestling grappling hold for hold, like a lot of those matches, like the Brain Busters match we watched last week, it was just a tag team match. Mm-hmm. And so it would have been as good as any tag team match on the planet in 2020. But you look at the cage match, and because it involved the big top rope bump and guy cut himself or whatever, now, you know, we watched Moxley Omega, for God's sake. Right. And it's like, what a quaint little match. They did a suplex off the top rope. whoop de doo But for the time, that was a great match. And not to mention the story involved with it. They, they told a good story, and, and the good guy won in the end. What do, you, what do you want? Oh, the other thing, too, is, so Boss Man gets handcuffed to the top rope. But... The handcuffs are much bigger than the rope. Yes. And so he can sure. move all over the place. Right. That, and so as a shoot, he could have run all the way to the turnbuckle, stretched out his arm, and put his feet on the ground and won. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're the, the classic pro wrestling handcuffs with like two feet of chain with cuffs yes. on the ground. And, and, <laughs> and Hogan cuffed him to the rope that's in that corner. So, so he yes. has to pretend like he's fucking stuck, yes. even though he could have got out. And then the best thing is... Slick runs over with the key. Hogan's already over the top rope. But when Slick runs over to unlock the handcuffs, Hogan stops climbing so that he can look around at the people and Mm -hmm. point as if to say, look, he's unlocking him. And then, of course, once he does his cartoonish deal, then he climbs down and wins. But it was great. Also cartoonish. Also cartoonish was Hogan uh, punching Slick and just just him stalking Slick and Slick literally jumping straight up in the air and and trying to run around the ring and he takes one bump that uh, that Bobby Heenan would have done a hundred times better but still um, it, it was just great it was a great story. Jesse interviews the Brain Busters. They maybe have thirty seconds. Bobby told us to believe in ourselves. If we believe it, we can achieve it. The belts are already ours. We just got to go get them. And here I wrote, a waste of time. Yes. And Gene interviews Demolition. And there are some things about Vince McMahon that will never change. So he's got the champions, Demolition, and the champions, the Brain Busters. He needs the champions to make fun of the challenger's name. And he sat and he thought, and he stroked his beard he doesn't have. He thought and he thought and he thought and he thought. Brain busters. Egg beaters. And so Smash or Axe, whoever it is, calls these guys the egg beaters. Like it's a terrible sick burn. It's not. It says they're nothing but chumps. We won't just beat them. We'll demolish them. We're demolition. We're the champs. When you think about it, I mean, what's so... What's so horrible about a team called the... Egg beaters. I take it. <laughs> We're gonna smash your fucking you call- heads like a raw egg. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna whisk them. Well, you actually have the machines that you can r- rattle and spin around as you came down to ringside. I mean, honestly, how is how is the egg beaters worse than the brain busters? You're doing the same thing. You're dropping oh, a guy on his head. You either beat his egg or you bust his brain. Excuse right, me. Do you, know, do you know what an you egg heard is? Me. <laughs> Yeah, the, the idea is the egg is your opponent's head. We're well, the egg beaters. The, he didn't say head beaters. He said egg beaters. Yeah, hey, I know. The egg is the head. <laughs> no, it's an egg. We're going to bust your head like a it's fucking a, egg. It's an actual goddamn egg out of a chicken. Bro, listen. <laughs> you, you can make this work, Vinny. Can you? Make, you could make egg beaters work as a tag team. <laughs> Fuck, they made brain busters. You ain't busting someone's fucking brain. No, they threatened to. Yeah, but you don't. <laughs> yeah, but they used a... I don't even think buster. I ever saw him use a brain buster. I uh, they did. All right, Brian. If you if you if you told me if you leave the house, I'm gonna bust your brain. And Craig told me if you stay in the house, I'm gonna beat your egg. <laughs> Dude, you're you're worried if he tells you that, Vinny. <laughs> well, you know when I say that out loud. See, yeah, it takes a, a I told you a, a different connotation. <laughs> I'll say. I'm, I'm rethinking this now. It's awkward. I I told you. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable. Let's How move on. dare you question me? <laughs> so anyway, so it's demolition versus the brain busters. You know, demolition is beating eggs. Excuse me. Demolition, same oh, okay. thing. 
Sure. Demolishing those two eggs. I can't tell you how many times I watched that demolition entrance video with the actual nuclear bomb footage and also eggs <laughs> being beaten. Fuck, mm -hmm. you could make it work. So, <laughs> demolition was not just a ripoff of the Road Warriors. They were a ripoff of the Road Warriors, who were also a very, very good tag team. But they were still a ripoff of the Road Warriors. What's amazing mm. about them so, is, when I was a kid, they were two chubby dudes. One of them looked right. like a school teacher. Yes. Now I look at them, I'm like, look at these giant fucking powerhouses. You know what these men are, Brian? They did some move. I can't even remember what it was, but it was to either Arn or Tully. That was pure power. And I watched it, I thought, look at these egg beaters. <laughs> Fuck. They would beat your eggs. That's what they do. Yeah. They went in there and they got the fucking heat on Smash. Can you imagine? Well, yes, Someone actually. sat down in the back and they went, heat on Smash. Well, Brian, you have to get the heat on one of them. And Axe yeah. is 30 pounds bigger and 10 years older. That's true. So you leave well, him with the sympathy because of his age. Well, there's that. But one way or the other, the other question is, how was Smash so good as Smash... That's a great question. And he was yes. no good at literally every other gimmick he ever did. He was he, no good as himself. <laughs> this is a fact. This is a fact. Part of it, I think, is that this is the only gimmick where he ever got to be a baby face. And he has great baby face fire. That's one possible explanation. But something about the studs and Tell the makeup. Tell me the Repo Man wasn't a baby face. I am telling you, huh. you were not supposed to cheer for the Repo Man. Something about the face paint and the leather and the studs gave him confidence he didn't have before. And he went out there to beat eggs. Clearly, you've never been a used car salesman. I have not. That's true. Mm. You got me there. So, <laughs> my favorite thing about this match is actually on commentary. Never had to deal with deadbeat customers. When Jesse's talking about how Bobby Heenan is so smart. If plan A doesn't work, he's always got a plan B. And then a plan C and D and F. And Vince says, what about plan E? And there's a pause. And Jesse just says... I forgot that one. <laughs> My favorite was Bobby's outside and Tully gets clotheslined over the top rope and he falls on Bobby. Yeah. yeah. And Bobby's furious and he starts screaming and he yells and he starts yelling at demolition. And Jesse says, do you think Bobby really wants to confrontate demolition? <laughs> <laughs> confrontate? Yeah. So as I started to say what felt like an hour ago... Demolition was a very, very good team that also ripped off the Road Warriors. And so the Brain Busters just went in there and did a Road Warriors match. Great. Mm -hmm. It yeah, was they awesome. Played the, they played the Four Horsemen. Yes. Facing and, the Road Warriors. And Demolition played the Road Warriors. E even Smash did what I believe is the only press slam of his career. And he threw totally into the ring. I don't remember seeing Smash ever do that before. That so, was actually the exact spot when I thought, why is he so good at Smash? Like, <laughs> and nothing else. God bless he the was, guy. He, he, no, you're right. He was much better at Smash than he was as Mr. Holden 1. He was awesome at Smash. Yes. Demolition was great. So they have a great shine at the beginning. Eventually, they just kick Smash in the leg and work him over for a while. And you mentioned earlier, Brian, you can always tell when shows are the uh, when matches are the blow-off and when they are to set up house shows. So in this match, they do a bunch of teases of hot tags, but the uh, Brain Busters always cheat to stop the hot tag. And finally, Axe is sick of the cheating. He hits the ring. He lays out the Brain Busters. He lays out the referee. That's a DQ. The Brain Busters win, but the titles don't change hands, and that sets up the house show loop. So, yes, Dude, the best again, part is he's all mad, and he fucking hip tosses the referee. Yes, <laughs> yes who the took referee a horrible goes bump. Flying ass over T. That's why he's a ref. <laughs> the referee rings the bell. They keep brawling a little bit, and all of a sudden, <laughs> they announce the winners of this match. The Brain Busters. And as they announce it, it's like a close-up of the side of Axe's head. Yes. And when he hears the Brain Busters have won, he <laughs> turns and he's furious. Yes. And even Jesse is like, dude, <laughs> <laughs> you're acting surprised? Yeah. He was, he was shocked that he was disqualified for hip-tossing <laughs> a referee oh, yeah. after he got in the ring illegally yes. and we had a wild four-way. Yes. That was a lot of fun. He clearly doesn't teach psychology at that school. Or logic. Jesse is there to interview Savage and Sherry again. Savage says there's no more ducking and hiding, Hulk Hogan. I am now the number one contender. 
because he beat the Anvil, Jim Knight. That's right. That means Anvil was number two in the rankings. I guess he must have been. He says, you'll go back to being a movie star. I got myself a manager. She's sensational. She's loyal. And she doesn't have wandering eyes. And the last bit of the promo, Jesse and Macho and Sherry all together go, oh, yeah. And then they cut to Boris Zukov in the ring. And Vince goes, <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> perfect. That was perfect comedy right there. You know, I guess in storyline, Hulk Hogan's manager is still Elizabeth. I suppose. Even though I don't think we see her again for she's, years. She's gone until she reunites with Randy. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. I guess we'll find out. So it's Boris Zukov versus Jimmy Snuka. It goes 73 seconds. Snuka hits the backbreaker and the splash, and he wins. Actually, I'm wrong. Apparently, she appeared at sporadic house shows as Hogan's manager. Hmm. Huh. Throughout the rest of 89. How about that? How odd. Gene interviews the Hulkster. Says, yeah, brother, I've been having problems with this Zeus dude before filming of the movie, during filming of the movie, and now after filming of the movie. Forget Hollywood, Zeus. Come to the ring. I'll show you what Hulkamania is like when it's running wild. And I want to personally invite all my Hulkamaniacs to come see my new movie. Didn't say when or where he would invite them to. It's their local theater on their own money, I presume, but... Hell of an invitation. He had some line about how you've seen me in all sorts of situations, but never no holds barred. It's like, hmm. It's weird. By the way, Elizabeth apparently, get this. So the Macho Man beats Hacksaw and becomes <laughs> yes. the Macho King. Absolutely. Okay. Right. <laughs> so at the end of the year, they actually do Macho Man versus Hacksaw matches. And Liz manages Hacksaw. What? <laughs> Can you imagine? No. No. Well, there you go. History. What a car ride that must have been. I'll, I'll say. <laughs> God. Anyway, Vince and Jesse say thank you for watching. They'll be back in July. And that's that. Yeah. Yeah, that was it. Jesse wasn't excited. It sure about was. That. <laughs> Man, I'm reading more about this uh, Miss Elizabeth thing right here. So she doesn't vanish. Like, she does that stuff and then has some appearances on the Brother Love Show with Sherry. Oh, that's not, okay. Well, yeah. She's in the corner for the uh, Dusty Roads and Sapphire against oh, yeah. Sherry oh, okay. and yeah, the Macho that's King. Right. That's right. I remember that now, yes. Yes. So she's around through uh, the end of ninety. Then I think she disappears until she returns after the retirement match. When do they do... Okay. Yes. Yeah. So they, they do the wedding and all that. They do the retirement match. Then they do the wedding. 91? The snake. That's all 91. Okay. The match made in heaven. The match made in hell. And I think they get divorced before yeah. they get fake yes. married. Yes. They were oh. real, real life divorced doing a fake wedding angle on TV. Yeah. Hmm. Had to be weird. Well, anyway, we're going to cover all that, everybody, because we're going to keep moving through all of these. What's the next one, Vinny? Uh, the next show, Brian, for Tuesday, which I guess is not the question you're asking me, but I Bad have to here. Tuesday. We don't want to get too far ahead. Tuesday, Brian, is WWF Thursday Night Smackdown from July 12th, 2001. The invasion is under full swing right now, and you've been warned. It sure <laughs> is. Hey, by the way, if you're a new subscriber... And you listen to the Brian and Vinny shows as we recap the invasion. Make sure on Friday you also listen to the Lance show because Lance was there. And Lance gives all sorts of insight into what happened during those shows. He did it this past Friday on Figure Four Daily, so go up and check that one out. And anyway, we got a lot of great stuff, so sign up now. Last chance this year, Cyber Monday special. And Vinny and Craig and I will be back on Tuesday mm -hmm. with that show. And then I'll be back tomorrow with... Observer Live, Filthy Four Daily, mm -hmm. and yes, the Wrestling Observer Radio Show. Vinny, are you going to tell us about fantasy football? Is that what you're about to say? No, Brian, I'm going to tell you that uh, next week here on Sunday night, we were watching Saturday Night's Main Event from July 29th, 1989. All right. Maybe we'll do football on Tuesday. That's our normal day. All right. We've skipped it for weeks now. Oh, That's yeah. also true. Yeah. That's also true. All right. Tuesday will be the fantasy football update. 
Although, can you tell me if it's true that Mike Sempervivi is currently in the lead? I can check. Is he playing you? No, nah, he just told me that today. I didn't believe him. <laughs> no. If he has I was, I was so far ahead. I understand yeah. how I could have. In the standings or just in today's scoring? I'm talking about the standings. Who is in he, first he beat place you. right I'm, now? I'm, I'm almost positive he beat you. It's loading very slowly. I may not be able to look this up after all. Probably everyone else is checking their fantasy football scores. Hmm. Let me check Paul Fontaine's thread on the board. Ah, forget it. We'll do it Tuesday. <laughs> hey, listen, we're out of here, everybody. We're going to wrap it up. We'll talk to you again after a while. Good night. Adios.